Hello, wonderful. This is Sarah, and I'm here with Christine Cochiola, and we are going to talk about how to protect our kids. If you have had a high conflict divorce or something along those lines, you may worry that they're turning your kids against you, or you may worry that about how your kids are dealing with the trauma or the fighting or the pain or, or their own situations. And Christine has been doing some extensive research on how to help our babies. Hello, Christine. How are you? Hello, Sarah. Thank you so much for having me here. Nice well, I am you. so nice to see you again. Yes, you've been on the Toxic Person Proof podcast before. Um, but I absolutely want to handle this subject with care. Such an important subject um, and one that I'm always passionate about. So what has your research said that may, maybe people don't naturally know or wouldn't know otherwise? Sure. So, oh gosh, so many things we could talk about. Um, so what we, what research is showing us over and over again is that children, well, let's just start with adults. Adults who do not experience physical violence, but experience what we know as coercive control, like this other insidious nuanced form of abuse um, that is what we know now as the foundation of most domestic abuse. Um, so coercive control is the foundation. We have some couples who participate in situational violence and that definitely occurs, but this is more about when one person has power and control over another. And so research is showing us over and over again that the more nuanced insidious abuse causes more trauma because we can't see it, because we can't put our finger on it. And I went through a situation in my own life um, where uh, I had a family member who was in a very terrible car wreck and was um, lifted by helicopter. And, you know, I mean, all these like terrible things kind of happened at one time. And they said, gosh, I just don't know how you're still standing. And I said, oh, I can handle anything except when someone teaches me not to trust myself or trust what I'm seeing with my eyes or trust what I'm seeing with my head. Um, and I think that is the, that is what you're talking about, right? It's uh, when they teach you not to trust yourself, it's a foundation of everything. It is, it is. And then, so if that's happening to the adult victim, what we haven't been talking enough about, and I spent the last three years in my doctoral program researching this, is we often say children are exposed to or witness domestic abuse. Well, first of all, if we're not even acknowledging that nonviolent abuse is abuse, <laughs> and then we're not, and then add on to there that we're not saying that children in these family systems are also victims, right? I mean, they are being victimized because, well, there's a, so many nuances to it, but for example, in my particular situation, I didn't really even know what was going on for so long as many victims, right? Because there was never physical violence. So I didn't, I couldn't put my finger on it. I knew something was wrong. But if I was regulating my behavior around the person just trying to make them happy, accommodate, make sure there wasn't anything that was going to be upsetting, right? Wasn't I in some ways teaching my children to regulate their behavior? And by the way, not just me, him, right? And so if we're always walking on eggshells as adult victims, what are the kids doing? They're learning to walk on eggshells. And yeah. this is a both and conversation, right? These yeah. conversations are always tricky because if you are someone who got a divorce, as many of my listeners did when your kids were 20 years old, the point of this is not to make you feel bad. No, right. Right. Mm, it's and, empowerment. <laughs> right, right. And we are also saying things that if someone has a five-year-old and they think, well, I'll just stay for the kids and do exactly what you were just saying, there is damage that happens. And so I want to just, Thank Bull you. by the horns, address it head on and say, I'm always so careful about these conversations because yes. they're so tricky because there is someone with a five-year-old listening who needs mm -hmm. to hear. Yes. And there's someone who got divorced in their fifties after their kids were raised, who probably has a lot of regrets. And the point is not to make you feel bad. 
Absolutely. I mean, first of all, right, we know it takes up to seven, on average, seven attempts to leave an abusive relationship. A lot of people end up staying because guess what? It gets oftentimes if it's coercive control, 90% of coercive control victims, it gets worse when they leave. It's called post-separation abuse. It intensifies. It's going to be worse. And if you have young children, uh, I mean, it's scary to say, but oh my gosh, like, is it easier to just stay, right? If you can leave, great. But this isn't at all about shaming anyone. Not at all. This is about empowering what would happen if you have this information or if you could do things a little differently now. How could you change or shift your behavior? Because this is the thing that um, I work with protective moms often, right? And this idea that they often are trying so hard to ensure that their children are um, safe and doing all of these really like monitoring your children, trying to behave in a certain way, but actually we end up gaslighting our children sometimes in this, in this, in these experiences and that gaslighting. Please, please tell them what you mean. I, 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 yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Man, I have some thoughts on that too, but please tell them yeah. what you mean. So if you're in a relationship that is abusive, but you are constantly trying hard to, um, you know, accommodate, make sure that things are going okay. Aren't you in some ways pretending that the abuse isn't happening? Even if you don't know it's abuse, aren't you in some ways minimizing it or dismissing it? Because you're again, trying to retain the family system, which we all have done, right? And so when you do that, you are basically sending a message in, 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 in unspoken words, but in your behaviors that everything's fine in this house. Everything's okay the way it is. And it's okay to tolerate these behaviors. It's okay to continue to behave like to pretend. And so then we teach our kids and that's the interesting part. So when I did finally leave, my kids didn't really see it for what it was originally because I had done such a good job hiding it, right? They knew, they knew there was something, but they, they didn't really see it in the manner. And so we end up gaslighting our children. <laughs> unintentionally, not our fault, but we end up doing that. And so how do we expect them to heal if we aren't able to acknowledge what's going on in the home, right? And I want to say even the language of, you may have some data around when words like coercive control came into our vocabulary, because mm -hmm. I want as to shout from the rooftops that these are newer words within our language, like even the word narcissist or uh, personality disorder, like right? those meant something really different 50 years ago in our common culture than what people are saying now. So if you're 50, that word may not have even existed, exactly. right? I talked to Patricia Evans, who wrote the emotionally abusive relationship. She's amazing. And, uh, yeah, she said that she wrote this book because, you know, it didn't exist. Mm -hmm. right? And I found that so fascinating, you know, when she, cause she's obviously still alive. Okay. So when she was getting her master's degree, hoping to study this subject, her professor said, well, there isn't a book on this for you to read. Okay. That is incredible. It wasn't illegal to hit your wife until 1973, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So in this conversation, it's a, and I know I keep going back to the both end. One, we just did not have the information before. Mm -hmm. It was just, well, I tell men are, well, that's how, that's what marriage is. Well, especially if our parents did yeah. that hiding and we want to empower the next generation to break the cycle. Absolutely. Yeah. And so it, coercive control um, and coercive persuasion were words that started basically in the late 50s and 60s um, with um, prisoners of war in China. And there was an MIT professor who did some research and we call it intimate terrorism, right? And this idea that you're trapped. And so then you start to kind of go along with what the, the abuser in, in the case of prisoners of war, like wants you to do, because you're, you're just trying to navigate the relationship in a way for survival. And I tell people this all the time. Um, I actually just spoke at the conference on crimes against women. And we we discussed this idea that the brain's number one job is to keep us safe. 
that's its number one job. So in the case of a child, I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but if safe means being with the person who might actually be a particular way, that's safe. I, I might have to align with that person because that feels the safest to me, even if that person isn't the safest person. Because we align with power. Oh. Mm -hmm. And that's why there's so, there's so in this work of healing where we have to connect with our own power. We can't just get out. We have to get better. Mm -hmm. right. right. For right. for that very reason, because I see so many women and they, everything's fine. Everything's fine. Everything's fine. Okay. Now I'm researching narcissism. Okay. Now everything's not fine. I'm going to get out and I need my children to take my side and stand against their father. Right. Right. That's right. the pattern I see over and mm -hmm. over. And, um, Okay. If it was working, mm -hmm. I'm a big fan. If it's working, keep doing it. If it's not working, try something else. And I want to say, I am not seeing it work because mm -hmm. you told them everything was fine. And, and then he has the power. Exactly. Right. You've not leveled the playing field on the mm -hmm. power right. wheel or the power dynamic. Right? right. And so your kids are seeing, okay. They're against each other now. One person is powerful. One person isn't. For me to be safe, I need to align with the person in power. Is that what you're saying? Ags, absolutely. And, and then let's just add in that how has the child perceived the victim as really weak? Is really weak. It does, you're probably, we talk about this all the time, victims of coercive control are probably the strongest people in the world. They withstood so much, but how have you been portrayed and how have you behaved to survive in that family system? You've, you've been portrayed as weak and you, and you actually feel weaker to the child. And so the best tactic for protective moms or protective parents, because again, we could talk about how this impacts both, it can impact both genders. Mm -hmm. um, but that the best tactic is for you to continually show your child that you are stronger than they think you are. That you don't need to say bad things about dad. You can speak the truth. You can speak the truth, but you don't need to. They need to know that you are so different than the abuser. That when they show up at your house, you're not going to grill them. You're not going to be jealous or which is reasonable by the way that he's with the other woman and he's taking your kids out to dinner with the other woman or that he bought them a car. I mean, those are all reasonable things that you need to deal with on your own with your own therapist. But that is not where your kids need you to be. Your kids need you to not care. They need you to not be worried about that. And they need to see you as someone who's more like, hey, what'd you have for dinner last night? Versus where did dad take you? Right. Or, um, and, and sometimes I know that I've seen this happen where even just the mention of time spent with the other person triggers the child. So this is, this is really important for protective parents to understand is that when your child is coming home to you, they are on, they are hypervigilant. They are waiting for you to question them. They are waiting for your reaction to anything they did during that time period while they were gone. They are ready to fight, flight, freeze. They are just ready to just have this reaction because when I said in the beginning of our conversation that we have suffered complex trauma and it's, we know now it's more significant than if someone had hit us, that your children have to. And their brains are developing. And because of that, there is a stunting of growth. Thank God it can recover. That's the great news. So it's not all bad news, but they are so traumatized that if you say that's a nice shirt and that's the shirt dad gave to them, and you think you're complimenting, by the way, you think you're giving a compliment. They are suspect. Why is she saying that about my shirt that my dad gave me? You understand that they are doing this all the time connecting why because every single thing you say to them they think there's a there's an underlying reason there's a covert reason for it just like with the abuser 
there's a covert reason for everything they ask you. So uh, it's about them understanding that your love is totally unconditional and that you have positive regard for them because the love with the other person is so conditional. One of the things I do with my kids is I'll say, what is one thing you could change about yourself to make me love you more? And of course the answer is nothing, you know, and they'll giggle and say nothing, nothing, you know, or so, you know, something like that. And, um, something else within my, this happened this morning. My son is very academic, very, 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 he loves like other people dream about going prof playing professional baseball. He wants to like go to an Ivy League school like that's he just he's very young but he just loves 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 school well this morning he says I was I was point four four points away from it I got an a minus in you know literature this you know and I was like oh well that doesn't seem to matter at all you know <laughs> I said nobody died okay nothing happened mm -hmm. okay you know? it just like sucked all the drama out of it mm -hmm. right now I didn't say, oh, you're failing math and you're not going to graduate high school. That's obviously a different situation. Right. Case. But in as what you're saying, sucking out the drama, sucking out the perfection, mm -hmm. sucking out the like, oh, another phrase I say, everybody makes mistakes, even grownups. Mm -hmm. Everybody makes mistakes, even grownups, you know, mm -hmm. or I'll say, if I got to choose if I lined up 200 kids and I got to pick which one I want, I'd still choose you. You know, to, these are examples in my own life for our listeners that I my kids love it. Right. Yeah. Like, you know, and even when they spill milk or something, you could see them like glance up to like, is she going to react? Nope. Right. Right. Never, and right? That, oh, and you just bring up a very important point, And that is that we really are unable to make a lot of those types of mistakes because the one time you do react, you've gone backwards 10 steps. And so they're so used to being prepared for us to have a response. I call it a reaction. So if they are used to see, by having us having us having a negative reaction mm -hmm. that we have to be so careful not to have it. And that means like even in circumstances where maybe so you're you're giving some those are great examples. What about when your kid comes home and you say, hey, um, what do you want for dinner? And they say, shut up to you because they're so filled with anger that their relationship with you is I call it the relationship is so fractured that they don't even communicate with you in an appropriate way. What do you do in those moments? And in those moments, you say nothing maybe. Maybe you say nothing when they talk to you that way. Now that doesn't mean you don't address it, but it's not, it's not about in that moment coming back at them and saying, how dare you say that to me? Or that was disrespectful. Or because their egos are so compromised due to the abuse that they are engaged in in this dynamic that what we're trying to do is help their ego strengthen and, and help their ego be okay with shame because remember the abuser is not good with shame at all the abuser hates shame that's why the abuser is so damaged he grew up in a home where there was no unconditional positive regard he was shamed for everything so his persona is to cover that shame so he puts out all of this information about shame. Sorry. <laughs> um, he puts out all of this, this information projects it onto everyone else. He can't handle it, right? So when children grow up in a really significantly situation, a significant toxic situation, they also take on some of that. Our role as a protective parent is to continue to wipe that away. We have to wipe that away. We are like kind of throwing them afloat in a stormy sea. That's what we have to do. And that means that when they are really horrible to us, we may not always address it in that moment. We may ignore it. We may disengage just like we did with the abuser, right? Remember how often it was about disengaging, not refraining from an interaction because it meant nothing when you would interact with the abuser, right? It meant nothing. So you, you almost, um, you diffuse, like you said, get rid of the drama, but if they're being abusive, you, it doesn't bother me. It's like I say, we all wear our armor around our children when they're this way to us and they're throwing arrows and they want to see which ones penetrate. And the less that penetrate, the more strong they see us. See when it penetrates, they're like, 
oh, she's weak. Oh, I can do this to her. And what does that do to the shallow ego for them? It builds up that shallow ego. So they continue to grow in that negative way versus when the arrows hit us and it deflects and it falls to the ground, it doesn't work. And they begin to see that that's not a good way to be. They begin to learn it without us saying, that was really horrible. How dare you talk to me that way? That was disrespectful. Instead, maybe later on, you'll say, you know what? I just want to let you know, I don't appreciate it when you say that to me. And you walk away. Mm-hmm. Not, right? I mean, I, I hope that all kind of makes sense. It's really about oh, the drama. Okay. I mean, it's, uh, that's it. When, uh, you know, toxic people feed, I'm not saying people's kids are toxic, but, you know, it feeds on that energy and that drama and that this and the circle and cycle. And it's like, huh. Hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. No, I mean, you know, and it's hmm. mm-hmm. okay. Yeah. And then you walk away and then later on, right. Mm-hmm. Um, and that is my favorite attitude to have about it because if it's, you know, you're crying and you know, this, that is not seen as strong. Right. right. You know, it's kind of exactly. Like, you go cry in your bedroom. Yeah, not away from everybody, away from everybody, because if you don't do that, then then they see you again as weak. Right. And they know that their words hurt. And you said that our kids aren't toxic. You're absolutely right. They're not toxic, but they are taking on some of the role of the abuser. We call that domestic abuse by proxy. So children become the proxies in the domestic abuse. He can't hurt you himself personally because he's not in the relationship with you anymore but he can do so by sending the child in as the pawn and that's what course of control is it's about using children as pawns in the relationship and maybe some of your listeners are still living with the abuser and if they are and that's happening this child is kind of like a little soldier doing the dirty work sometimes that's so painful because we never expected our kids to first of all, have to experience this, right? And then to second of all, be turned against us in some way. And painful. Terrible. I mean, no no words. It's so terrible. Um, And I want to bring up, because I know some people are probably like, how in the world do you, (laughs) do you manage this? I want to say, I know it's annoying. I know the conversation about self-care and investing in yourself and taking care of yourself. I know those are annoying conversations probably at this stage in the game. So he was like, yeah, I know everybody's like, oh, I need a self-care. I need to sleep. I needed this. This is why. And I talk about if you have had a high conflict situation and you're in this situation, you don't get the option. You, you touched on it before. You don't get the option of reaching the end of your rope. No. <laughs> right. And in normal houses, I have a, I know someone, um, she has a great relationship with her parents, but there were several kids and her mom was stressed out. They were working. And one time she had a friend over and the mom said, what, we're having hamburgers for lunch. And she said, my friend doesn't like hamburgers. And the mom slapped her in the face. Mm-hmm. Like, a, but it was a very uncharacteristic. She was reactive. Her- from her own trauma. Definitely okay. Definitely, 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 definitely not saying that's okay. But right. mom was kind of at the end of her rope and had a reaction, right? Mm-hmm. That circumstance, there were no real consequences from it. Mm-hmm. Right. That they were still right. married. They were happily married. There, you know, there were no in other circumstances. <laughs> we and it's not fair. It's not fair. Yeah. Right. You know, to say. You have to be superhuman, but be superhuman in getting strategies to protect yourself, not superhuman in thinking, I'm just going to grin and bear it. Or is, do you agree with that, Christine? A hundred percent. This is what I would say. And um, I think I mentioned to you a program that I'm going to be starting. It's called the protective parenting program. And the idea behind it is that in order to be the best protective parent of our children, we actually have to begin to heal our own trauma. And so in that case, like end of sentence and not to interrupt you, but it's like, there is no way around like zero chance you know, and I remember I was talking to somebody one time, they were talking about investing in a program like this. And they said, well, then I won't be able to send my son to space camp. I was like, Okay. So how many people go to therapy when they're older and didn't go to space camp? Not that many. How many people say, (laughs) my mom 
was depressed and miserable and my dad was so controlling and then he broke my mom and she never recovered and blah, 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 blah. Like that's, that's the long-term consequences. Right. And it just seems less scary. I understand it's less scary to pay for space camp than it is to do some of this work. I I get it. Right. 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 And so definitely you're absolutely like this idea that if I can't figure out how to regulate my own emotions, because your kids, guess what their job is? First of all, even if there's not an abusive situation, their job is to trigger you all day long. I mean, you know, they're not going to clean their room. Maybe when you have adolescence, you know, the whole, you know, I mean, so we don't sleep well when they're babies. I mean, there's so many things that add into us not having appropriate reactions sometimes, but we do have to have, if we can heal, they can heal. If we can, if we can become less reactive, they will be less reactive. And here's the thing. If the attachment is fractured because the abuser had that primary goal, that's what he wanted. If he, if that relationship is fractured, you can reignite it. If you can be less reactive. So you see, it's all related. And, and so I, want protective moms to be more empowered, to understand that they actually have a role. Could you imagine if someone told you, if you had a very sick child, God forbid, right? Very sick child. And somebody told you, if you do these things, your child will be healthy. You would do them in a heartbeat. Okay. I'm telling parents who are listening that their children are very ill. They've been coercively controlled by the abuser. They've suffered psychological trauma. And you, as a protective parent, have the key to making them healthy. You can. Mm -hmm. Like, wow, wait a minute. We'd all be running to the doctor if the doctor had a remedy and our child was sick. There are ways to get our children healthy. We just have to figure out how to be less reactive and to not engage in the behaviors that they are actually testing us with. It's all a test because guess what? They can't rely on the other person and they don't think they can rely on you. So if you keep breaking every time they try to break you, right? With their words or their behaviors, if you keep breaking, they're gonna know you're unreliable. Children need at least one caretaker who loves them unconditionally with positive regard. And if you're not gonna be that person, they are screwed. Mm-hmm. They say it, but they are. May I tell you a secret, Christine? Mm-hmm. Uh, the in all the conversations I've had, and I've you know mainly had conversations with women. It's interesting how few women complain about their fathers, even when their fathers were terrible. Mm-hmm. For example, my dad sexually abused me. My mom didn't protect me, and it's quite obvious that the dad was the one who did the most wrong. Right. And it's interesting and not fair that the mom is the one. Now, the mom should have protected her. I'm not defending the mother here. I, I, but I am pointing out exactly what you're saying, right? Like there are two paths. One, you become less reactive. You become the protective parent. You are seen as strong success. Two, you remain depressed, you distract yourself with YouTube videos, you try to travel and run away from your problems, or just, well, I'm just going to be super involved in my kid's life, so involved that they, I'm just going to love, 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 which they are going to see as control, 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 right? Or I'm going to ignore what they're at. Like, there are two paths. Like, we see it. Right. One is successful. One is not successful. It is. I get frustrated when people talk about healing being hard or like scars last forever or some of these things, I was like, it's not hard. You're making it hard because you're trying to like just distract yourself and call it healing. Mm-hmm. I'll just scroll through some dating apps. Okay. And, and you can. Mm-hmm. Out of my integrity and boundaries, I believe people have permission to do whatever they want in their lives. And out of my integrity, you know, my master's degrees in research, I know you got your doctor in this research. It's like, I cannot ignore the data and not tell you. It's Mm -hmm. like people who smoke cigarettes are not as healthy as people who don't smoke cigarettes. Mm -hmm. It it just is. Mm -hmm. You can smoke if you want to, but it's very clear data. (laughs) 
this is this isn't a guessing game. I don't want people to feel like it's a guessing game. You know, just like you said, if your kid was sick, you would do it. And then I think sometimes in healing from a toxic relationship or protecting your kids, it's like, yeah, but scars last forever. Mm -hmm. No, right? No, right? Yeah. If you're not doing if you're not taking that path, it is going to last forever and it's going to cycle and cycle and cycle. Well, the cycle, the cycle. So obviously, I mean, first of all, I'm so sorry you experienced that. It is such a prevalent problem in our world where there's abusers and there's, um, I used to work, work in child welfare and so often moms did not protect their children. So often over and over again. So that's a, that's such a significant problem in our society that children get abused and that- I I didn't experience that. Someone had told me that. I want to, I want to clear that oh, up. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. Oh. Someone had told me that story. Yes. And I was, yes. it was interesting to see their anger was geared at their mother for not protecting them. Right. Versus their father at right. acting badly. Yes. It, it's not fair. But also, I, 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 th I found it empowering yes. mm -hmm. because the dad was kind of actually smaller in the people's mind. The mom mm -hmm. was actually the one. So if that's true and the mom is empowered and healing and happy and thriving, what, right. what does that do to the child? Mm -hmm. Right. And so I think you're talking about betrayal trauma, right? So this child, this person, you know, was betrayed not only by father, but also by mother. Totally. Right. And so that's the question, you know, do we want our children to see us as someone who's betrayed them because we weren't able to be strong? Listen, we all decided to have kids or maybe we didn't, but we have children and it's our job to protect them. And, and that means unfortunately leaving your own issues at the door, deal with them with your own person, get therapy, go in the bedroom and cry, take a cold shower, do all of those things. I mean, you know, you know, your child's coming home. I, I like maybe just give you a little strategy here. So, you know, your kid's coming home, you know, they come home and they tend to be very, like, you don't know who you're going to get when they walk in the door. Are they going to be like angry? Are they going to be happy? You don't know. They're coming home from the abuser's house and they're coming in the door. How do you prepare for that? I'll tell you what you do. You take a nice freaking cold shower and you de-escalate your nervous system. If you can, you go for a run. You said this before, do some self-care and then you get prepared for what they're going to tell you when they come in the door. Are they going to tell you they went to dinner with dad and his girlfriend and her whole family? And you're going to be so triggered and upset about that because come to find out he had multiple affairs and now he's bringing this other woman into their life and that hurts you. That's painful, right? It can't be. It can be, but not in front of them. What are you going to say when your child tells you something that triggers you? I want you to be ready. I want you to have a response. Oh, honey, I'm glad you had a good time. Be ready. What do you want for dinner? Like diffuse it. But don't. But if you're not ready for what they're going to say and it triggers you and you're reactive, you've totally screwed it up. You've disempowered yourself. Mm -hmm. be ready and role play role play oh i say role play over and over again what does your kid say what is their typical thing of saying when when you tell them they've got to clean their room and they get really nasty with you you're prepared that they're going to do that they do it all the time what do you need to do differently so that they realize they're not getting your your goat every time right how do, what do you need to do yeah and i want to wrap everything we're saying in like sugar and love and kindness and kisses and you <laughs> and like everything, you know, because I remember I did an interview one time um, and they said, gosh, when you're talking about toxic relationships, it's just not fair. Mm -hmm. And I was like, for us to heal, for us to move forward, we have to take fair and just like, okay, no, it's not like, the more we wrestle that bear of this isn't fair that I have to do all this, this isn't fair that all this is happening. The more we are wrestling that bear of fairness, the di the more disempowered we are going to be. Mm -hmm. No, that's popping up. It's like, gosh, that's just not fair. And I say, yep, it's not. And I want to focus on what's strategic, mm -hmm. not what's fair. Right. Because it's fair. Right. We are very aware. I know you and I are talking and we're not crying and we're not weeping and we're not, you know, disempowered right now, but it doesn't mean that's because this is the only version of us that has existed. We, we, 
we have rest of our own bears, right? And, and so I want to say like, oh, we get it. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Sugar and kisses and unicorns and buck up. Let's get to work. Exactly. <laughs> yes. This is what works. It's, the other way doesn't. Yeah. Right? And I love that you're saying this because I feel like it's so important to say, I don't think there's any greater heart, heartache than knowing the child that you gave birth to, that you expected to raise in a beautiful family, that that child has been so harmed and that that child could behave so horribly to you when all you have done is love that child implicitly. It, there's no greater heartache, but, but what but protective moms and parents need to realize is that your child has been indoctrinated in a regime of coercive control and they are just trying to survive that's all they're trying to do is survive and in coercive control going back to the army and war thing right mm -hmm. i don't think anyone says well this isn't fair war isn't fair of course war isn't fair right mm -hmm. we go oh my gosh this is terrible what strategy are we going to come into the enemy camp with or what strategy are we going to use to survive or you oh, know what's it's all about strategies it's all, right. it's, I, I use, I, I, I sometimes say it's about, we have to manipulate the manipulator almost. Like we have to be better than them. We have to see it from up here and look down and say, okay, these three things are going to happen. And this is how I'm going to deal with them versus always being on the defense, right? Mm, we got to be playing tactical here. Tactical. I, I literally have that anytime in communicating with a toxic person or being in this, you always need to be on offense. You know, mm -hmm. if you find yourself on defense, exit quickly, like you're about to lose. Exactly. Right? Um, so you talked about the strategy of role play, the strategy of what I call the three door. What you mentioned just then, I, I call it the three doors, like best case scenario, worst case scenario, most likely scenario. So, and when there's anxiety coming in, maybe about your child coming home from a tough situation, it's like, okay, best case, he says, um, hey mm -hmm. mom, okay, great. I know, check, I know what I'm gonna do. Right. Worst case, he throws his backpack across the room, tells me I'm stupid, he doesn't wanna be here. Right. Okay, what am I gonna do? Most likely case, he says, leave me alone, goes into his room, shuts the door for an hour. What am I going to do then? Right. Um, mm -hmm. so I, I love that. I love that, that preparing, um, any other of your favorite tips that you think of when it comes to this? Yeah, I guess that I would say that a tip would be to be, um, aware that any time that you are trying to direct your child, like you're trying, like you're just being a mom, right? So if you say something like, um, sweetheart, uh, your, your shirt's unbuttoned in the back, right? Remember that these kids are very often so triggered that, that, that they may react to even something like that. So I guess the point is, is less is more. So, and, and here's another thing. And we do this with little ones all the time. Like we, 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 we say nine good things a day about them or reaffirm for them. And maybe that one correction, remember that every correction to this child who is in trauma mode, every correction feels like a criticism, feels like you hate them because that's what they're prepared to take from you because that's how they feel in the other person's home. So be very cautious about corrections, let as much go as you can. Mm -hmm. Let as much go as you can. Let as much go as you can. And if things aren't extreme, I would also add, you know, kind of what I did with my son when he was like, oh, I made the A minus, which is a big deal to him. I was like, oh, well, good thing nobody died. Like, you know, and to him, he, that was light and that was funny, right? Make everything this, light. This is a judging by the situation, you know, he, I know he's a perfectionist and so he's going to be hard on himself and I don't want to put that pressure on him. And so it was just like, well, good thing nobody died. And his little buddy was like, your grade did. I was like, I think it's going to be okay. I think, I think we're, I think we're going to be able to live with an A minus. And I remember talking about sucking out the drama, mm -hmm. right? That's kind of an example of, um, when possible, you know, when someone's super triggered and they are super, you know, at the end of their rope. That would not be appropriate. It would probably backfire. But especially if your kids are younger and you're, you know, you're trying to prepare, how do I navigate this 
yeah, as, as they get older, and it's like, oh, you dropped out of college today. Okay, that's, oh, well, okay. <laughs> you know, you know in, in some of the building blocks, because I, I both, I want to be both preventative. Yeah, I think about all these in like stages of cancer, right? And I think some of what you're talking about is in level, you know, stages three and four of cancer. And we have to have tactics for that. And then if we're only in stage one, how do we kind of prep ourselves for success in the future and kind of set some of those baselines and habits in the future too? Right. No, that totally makes sense because part of the program that um, I've created is this idea of understanding grief and loss because we have to kind of grieve what we expected. And until we grieve that, right? And we go through the stages of grief. And so really what we know is it's about acceptance. It's radical acceptance. This is my life. This is what's happened. Now, what do I do with it? How do I, my child could either grow up to be really insecure, filled with anxiety, unfortunately, maybe end up in a horrible relationship, or maybe could be an offender because the ego was never developed the way it was supposed to be developed. There's so many ways that this could go. I'm going to, I'm going to find meaning in this. David Kessler talks about finding meaning. It's the sixth stage of grief. He worked with Elizabeth Kubler-Ross before she died. And, and they started talking about what are we going to do to make this child, my beautiful child's life different than I expected. It's already different than I expected, but it could go in a really bad way. I'm going to, I'm going to make changes in me so that my child has a better chance of being successful. And that means by the way, and this is a huge thing, lowering the bar. This kid's been through a lot of really bad things. This kid may not do the normal college route. This kid may go part-time. This kid may work at, you know, a store for a long period of time and maybe not go to college because they've been traumatized. So it's accepting it and accepting them for who they are. Remember, this child doesn't feel accepted or loved by their other parent. And truly, they think they, they don't see it. We need to love them unconditionally. Accept well, them for who they are. Yeah. I know you have a great program coming up. Will you tell people where they can find out more about protective parenting? Sure. It's called the Protective Parenting Program. It's at www.protectiveparentingprogram.com. It's also, um, you can find it under iknowyourheart.com because who knows their children's hearts better than their protective parent. So iknowyourheart.com. Um, and it will be about a 10 week program. I haven't quite figured it out, but it's, so I'm a licensed clinical social worker. Um, so I will be providing psychoeducation on what their children have experienced and also the clinical support um, over 10 weeks so that they are, are, they have the armor. I'm hoping people leave my program with the armor and they're ready to do what needs to happen with their children. And throughout the process, um, we'll be doing role-playing and giving examples and people will be able to have a group of support too with one another. So that's my hope. Well, I love it. And thank you so much for the work you've done on, on this subject. I know um, three years of research is not, uh, is no small feat. Uh, so I, I thank you for bringing your wisdom to us today. Oh, thank you. Well, I will say that's how I found meaning. So you're listening. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I understand. Thank you. Thank you. Most thank importantly, you. for helping us become toxic person proof, especially helping our babies. Our babies. Thanks.